Uh, so today we are coming to the uh, last section of Hebrews, and we are coming uh, to the conclusion of our series in the book of Hebrews. It's all about Jesus. Uh, I hope that you have found this series uh, to be helpful. Uh, if you have missed any of it, and this is your church home, uh, I really encourage you to uh, go and catch up, you know, try to watch the messages uh, that you miss. They're available online, and so try to catch up on those. By the way, before I go any further, I meant uh, to acknowledge that we have some very special people with us today. Uh, John and Adam Notstein are here all the way from the great state of Texas, long-term members of our church. We're glad they're here. Why don't you give them a hand? So as you're familiar with by now, if you have uh, been with us during any of this series, uh, the author has throughout the book of Hebrews and in a variety of ways made the case that Jesus is greater than everything uh, that came before him. He is greater than the law. He is greater than all of the Old Testament sacrifices. He is greater than the religious rituals and uh, customs of Judaism. Uh, Jesus is greater than everything that came before him. And everything that came before him actually was for the purpose of pointing forward to him. The Old Testament and all of those sacrifices and laws and rituals, the New Testament, the entire Bible, it is all about Jesus. He's greater than what came before him because what came before him was all about him. The author has made this case because many of those to whom he wrote were facing the temptation to turn away from Christ and to turn back to the religious traditions of Judaism. And this was something that was unthinkable to the author of Hebrews. And so he spent 13 chapters making the case that Jesus is greater than everything that they were tempted to turn back toward. He was greater than all of that. And because he is, they should resist the temptation that they're facing. They should hold on to Jesus. They should remain faithful to Jesus. I've noted many times throughout this series that while our circumstances are very different than theirs, many believers today are facing the temptation to turn away from Jesus. And the temptation must be resisted because Jesus is greater than everything that tempts us away from from him. And we've talked about that a lot, so I'm, I'm not going to, to go into that more today, but, but Jesus really is greater than everything that tempts us to turn away from him. So, so don't, don't do it. Don't give in to this uh, plan of the enemy in your life, but hold on to Jesus. Today we're going to wrap up the series by looking at just two verses, uh, chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, which are the benediction, the closing prayer to the book of Hebrews. And in this prayer, this benediction, the author speaks of the greatness of God, and he speaks of the power of God that is available to believers. And so I want to spend just a few minutes today highlighting the things that we find in this benediction. So let's look at it now together, Hebrews 13, 20, and 21. I think it'll be on the screen behind me, and let's read this together, okay? Are we... Are we ready? Let's read. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought... Something happened? Okay, take that. Uh, what's wrong? A different version? We really struggle with this, don't we? Okay. Enjoy my voice as I read the text. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a good time to point out that you can get the gist of it uh, through lots of different versions of the Bible but the one I just read is the best one. <laughs> All right, very good. <laughs> All right. So the very first thing that we see in this benediction, God is a God of peace. 
If you think about the people who are reading the book of Hebrews, it is disrupted peace that has the Jewish converts to Christ facing the temptation to, re to reject Jesus and return to the religious rituals of their previous way of life. In part, they are tempted to do this to try to escape the relational disturbances they're facing with their family and friends who have not received Jesus because the relational disturbances were serious. And those relational disturbances led into many different kinds of disturbances, financial disturbance in their life. Their comfort and even their safety had been disturbed. And that has created fear in the believers. They want freedom from the disturbances. And they want freedom from the fear that they are feeling. And so they're tempted to reject Jesus and return to their former way of life to try to put an end to the disturbances, the upheaval that has come into their life since coming to faith in Jesus. Commitment to Jesus, as he told us himself, is costly. It can create disturbances in our lives. It can create disturbances in relationships. It can create disturbances at work. It can create disturbances in our social circles. And when it does, within all of those circumstances, within all of those disturbances, here's what the author of Hebrews wants us to know. God is a God of peace. He's a God of peace. The author is reminding them that the answer to the disturbances in their lives and the fear those disturbances have created is not turning away from Jesus because he's the God of peace. The answer for them and the answer for us when disturbances in our lives compromise our peace is never to turn away from Jesus, which we're often tempted to do, but it's to trust Christ more fully and to draw closer to him because he is the God of peace. Philippians 4, 7 tells us that the peace of God transcends all understanding. And I think at least in part what that means is that the peace of God is not dependent on life being free of disturbances. It, peace isn't dependent upon everything around you being tranquil. The peace that God provides can be experienced right in the middle of huge disturbances, huge disruptions in life. We see this all through Scripture. God never once promised us freedom from difficulty, but He has assured us over and over through His Word that He will provide peace for us in the midst of the difficulty. One of my favorite passages that captures this idea that communicates this truth is Psalm 46, 1 through 2. Here's, here's what it says. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Listen to this. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake at their surging. No matter what's happening, even the earth giving way, the mountains falling into the sea, the psalmist says we will not fear. Why? Because God, the God of peace, is our refuge. He is our strength. The enemy of your soul wants to try to convince you that, he is trying to convince you that life will be better, that you'll have fewer disturbances, you're going to have more fun and tranquility by turning away from Jesus. But don't succumb to his lies. Jesus Christ is the God of peace. If you need peace, your answer is to stay committed to Jesus, not turn away from him. It is to press more into him, to turn to him. He is our source of peace. He can provide it even in the most difficult circumstances. And many of you can give testimony that that is true from your own lives. You know it's true because you have lived that. The second thing I want to note from the text is that Jesus was brought back 
from the dead. Verse 20, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. Jesus was not, this is an important distinction, Jesus was not spared from death. He was brought back from death. He really died. He really did. And then he really came back from death. First Corinthians tells us that Jesus was the first of many to come back from death. That, my friends, is a wonderful truth to hold on to. He was the first, but he's not the last. Many are going to come back from death. Not too long from now at 1.30 this afternoon here at the church, we're going to be celebrating the life of Andrew Lang. We mourn Andrew's passing, and yet we are comforted in knowing that Andrew is one of those many who will be brought back from death because Jesus defeated sin, death, and the grave for Andrew and for all of us who trust in him. Amen. Amen. You see, death thought that it had the last word over the life of Jesus. But Jesus was brought back from death. And because he was, death never has the last word over the lives of believers. Because Jesus has defeated sin, death, and the grave, Jesus has the last word over the life of every believer. And Jesus has proclaimed eternal life for all who trust in him. I am so thankful that we know this truth. I am so thankful to Jesus that he has defeated death and secured eternal life for each and every one of us. And friends, we are to live our entire lives in appreciation of that knowledge of that truth that we have. It's a wonderful gift that we've been given. The next thing we see in this benediction is that Jesus uh, is our shepherd. We see him as our shepherd. Verse 20 refers to him as that great shepherd of the sheep. This is a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. We, we see it in several places. I'll mention just three here today. In John 10 and 11, Jesus said of himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So he's the good shepherd. And then in today's text, Hebrews 13, 20, Jesus is called the great shepherd who was brought back to life through the blood of the eternal covenant. And then in 1 Peter 5, 4, we read this, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In each of these descriptions, we see Jesus as shepherd, we see the various ways that he cares for us, his sheep. He is the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. He lived a sinless life and died a substitutionary death for each and every one of us. He is the great shepherd who rose from the dead, was brought back from the dead because of his sinless life and substitutionary death. He fully paid the debt of sin mankind owed and secured freedom from death for all who would trust in him. And then he is the chief shepherd who is coming again and crowning those who belong to him with glory. Friends, Jesus Christ is coming again. He is the good shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. He died for us. He secured eternal life for us. He's coming again for us. For all of this, he's worthy of your trust. So I appeal to you today, don't consider turning away from him, but more fully entrust yourself to him. He's worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our praise. And in all of these things that we've covered to this point, we see the greatness of Jesus in this benediction. He's the God of peace. He conquered death. He's the good, great chief shepherd who is coming again. We see 
the greatness of Jesus, we see the power of Jesus. And then in verse 21, we're given specific information about what God can and will do for us, what the God of peace, who conquered death and cared for his people and is coming again, will do for us. The benediction again. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. Here's what God will do for us. God will equip us to do his will and to be pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. God's people are expected by God to do his will. God's people are expected by God to live lives that are pleasing to him. We need to think about that more frequently than we do. We aren't, we aren't just, and I say this very in tune with my own sinfulness, we are not saved just to keep sinning like nothing ever happened. We are to live lives that are pleasing to God. That's the evidence, the fruit of salvation. Something is supposed to change in us. But here is what this is telling us. God does not leave us to our own strengths and abilities to do what he asks of us. We're, we're, we're not required to live for God in our own strength, but God himself empowers us to do what he asks us to do. And here's a thought that I think we'd do well to grab hold of and really allow it to get deep into our spirits. It is the same power of God that brought Jesus back from the dead that will equip us with everything good for doing God's will and living our lives in ways that are pleasing to him. Let me say it a different way. Resurrection power isn't just for bringing dead believers back to life. It is for empowering living believers to be who they're supposed to be and do what they're supposed to do. The Pentecostals, I think, are so much better about understanding this and believing it and receiving it than what much of the rest of evangelicalism is. You see, there is more power available to us for the here and now than what most of us experience. There is a good bit of mystery in how some believers more fully experience the power of God for living victorious over sin and living lives that are pleasing to God than what other believers do. There's a lot of mystery involved in that, but there can be no doubt that this is the starting point. A clear awareness, believing deep in your spirit that more power is available to us. We're not on our own. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to help us to live for God here and now. It's not just to raise dead believers in the future, but it's to empower the work of God right now. May each of us, members of Living Hope Church, really believe this. And it's my prayer today that we would, in increasing measure, actually experience this, both for our own good and for the good of the world that needs more believers operating in the power that is available to us. The world desperately needs more believers tapping into the resurrection power that God has for us right now. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. It's Jesus' own blood that brought him back from the dead and secures the eternal covenant. Jesus is the good, great, and chief shepherd. God empowers believers to do his will through Jesus Christ. As we've seen throughout Hebrews, we see in the benediction, it is all about Jesus. He is greater than everything that came before him that pointed to him. He is greater than everything that tries to get us to turn away from him. The Old Testament was about him. The New Testament is about him. The eternal covenant was secured by him. Death and sin have been defeated by him. Resurrection and eternal life are secured by him. He's coming again to make all things new. It is all about Jesus. Amen. And so the author writes, to Jesus be glory forever and ever. It's all about Jesus. All praise, all glory belongs to Jesus. May our lives demonstrate that all praise and all glory belongs to Jesus for who he is, for what he's done, for what he's yet to do. He is worthy of praise and honor to Jesus. Be glory forever and ever. And so for the next few minutes, and the reason I did the service the way that we've done it today, for the next few minutes, I want to invite you to praise Jesus in a way that demonstrates that we really do believe he's greater that we really do believe it's all about him, that we really are thankful that he died for us and defeated death for us, that he secured eternal life for us, and that he's coming again for us. Let us, through our worship over these next few minutes, say this, to Jesus be all glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand. 